Final decision. NASA decides to shoot down Comet 3 I Atlas. Total destruction. That is where everything begins. And I'm telling you this as someone who stood in the briefing room when the first impossible numbers appeared on the screen. I'm Michio Kaku, and what I'm about to say is not speculation, not theory, but the unfolding of a cosmic ultimatum that forced humanity into the most consequential scientific judgment call of our generation. The moment the telemetry came in, every instinct I had screamed that this object, designated C-2023A3 slash Atlas, but known within the lab as 3I Atlas, the third confirmed interstellar visitor, was wrong. Its orbit was wrong. Its velocity was wrong. Its composition was wrong. Everything about it violated the quiet stability of our solar system. And that was before the calculations began to paint a picture that no physicist ever wants to see, a converging trajectory. The discovery itself was almost mundane. Another faint streak caught by the Vera C. Rubin Observatory during its nightly sky survey. But when the modeling team fed the data into the orbital solver, the room went silent. The comet wasn't just passing through. It was threading a gravitational needle from deep interstellar space, accelerating in a way completely inconsistent with a natural long period comet. 18 months, that was the window, a cosmic countdown. The preliminary simulations fanned across the screen like a nightmare blooming in slow motion. Earth lay squarely in the path of possibility. The impact corridor slashed through major population centers across three continents. Even the best case scenario, a near miss, was catastrophic. With tidal disruptions and atmospheric shock waves large enough to destabilize global weather for decades. As physicists, we often emphasize probabilities, margins of error, uncertainties. But here, uncertainty was the enemy, and the error bars were shrinking toward inevitability. Yet the physical danger wasn't the only anomaly. Spectrographic data from pan stars revealed something I still cannot explain fully. Dense metallic signatures, unusually high concentrations of heavy elements, and a bizarre distribution of isotopes that do not match any known astrophysical formation process not primordial ice, not silicate rock, not anything that fits our models. It was as if the comet carried the fingerprints of a place that had never played by our laws of chemistry. And then came the signal. A repeating narrowband emission buried deep in the noise, faint, structured, not quite random. We initially assumed it was a sensor artifact, perhaps a thermal glitch. But as we filtered the data, the pattern sharpened. A pulse, then a pause then a pulse of different amplitude, too regular to ignore, too deliberate to dismiss. Something was emanating from 3I Atlas, and whether it came from its composition, its motion, or something embedded within it, we did not know, but we knew it was sending something. A message? A malfunction? A natural resonance? I will not claim certainty. I will only say that I have spent 40 years studying the mathematics of the cosmos, and patterns that repeat with such precision are rarely accidental. When NASA convened the emergency session, every lab, every modeling center, every agency brought forward their best case and worst case projections. And all paths converged on one brutal truth. If 3I Atlas remained intact, Earth would not. The kinetic energy alone, amplified by its anomalous density, could erase cities. The isotopic instability could vaporize oceans. Even the magnetic signature it carried, yes, magnetic, hinted at an interior we had never imagined in conventional cometary physics. The conversation no longer centered on curiosity. It centered on survival. That was when the president asked NASA directly, unequivocally, what is the final decision? And NASA answered, total destruction. Operation Aegis. A nuclear interdiction in deep space, a preemptive strike on the most enigmatic interstellar object humanity has ever observed. The scientific community erupted, diplomats panicked, engineers scrambled, but the order stood. Still, none of them, not NASA, not the government, not even the astrophysics committees, knew the part that haunted me the most, the signal, that faint structured whisper embedded inside 3I Atlas growing stronger as it approached. 
a signal that, just before destruction, revealed something even more unsettling. When the emergency summit at the United Nations began, the atmosphere was unlike anything I had ever experienced in my career. It wasn't diplomacy, it wasn't strategy, it was something raw, an unspoken fear that the cosmos itself had issued a challenge we were unprepared to answer. Delegates from NASA, ESA, Roscosmos, JAXA, and every major scientific council crowded into a chamber that suddenly felt far too small for the weight of what we were discussing. And I sat there, knowing the signal inside three, I, Atlas, continued to pulse. Two factions emerged almost immediately. The first, led by several European scientists, insisted we attempt a deflection, a gentle push, a kinetic impactor, a gravity tractor. Their argument was simple. We cannot destroy the most important interstellar object ever discovered. We must preserve it for science. They spoke about protecting knowledge, about the opportunity to analyze matter from beyond our sun, about the ethical responsibility to avoid irreversible destruction. The second faction, NASA, Pentagon advisors, and several independent physicists argued the opposite. Survival first, curiosity second. The models were too tight, the timeline too short, the density too unpredictable. A deflection attempt could shatter three I atlas into a swarm of smaller fragments, each one potentially lethal. One large impact was tragic. A rain of a thousand molten shards, apocalyptic. I watched as the debate grew sharper, more emotional. Every projection was placed on display screens, energy curves, fragmentation probabilities, gravitational drift simulations, cluster impact scenarios. But no matter how the data was visualized, it converged on the same grim conclusion. The margin for error was microscopic. Then I revealed the signal, a narrow band transmission emerging from within the comet, stable over time, increasing in clarity as three I Atlas approached the inner solar system. The room fell silent, not panicked, not curious, just silent, because a natural object should not emit a structured frequency. A piece of primordial rock from another star system should not behave like a beacon. I played the filtered signal. A rhythmic pulse, like a coded sequence. Not language, not music, not noise. Something in between. Something deliberate. And in that moment, the debate fractured into something far more volatile. Some argued the signal justified preservation. If it is a message, they said, destroying it would be the greatest scientific tragedy in human history. Others insisted it justified destruction even more strongly. If something inside that object is transmitting, they countered, we cannot allow it to reach Earth. The stalemate hardened. Political leaders whispered in corners. Scientists paced. Advisors summoned classified documents and the orbital clock continued counting down toward inevitability. Then came the final tipping point, a new set of simulations showing that if three I atlas fragmented during a deflection attempt, Earth would be struck not in one location, but across multiple hemispheres simultaneously. No evacuation, no shielding, no recovery. NASA stood up and presented the final recommendation. Operation Aegis, total destruction. A nuclear strike in deep space before the comet entered the gravity well of Mars. The president accepted the recommendation. And as the meeting adjourned, I watched the delegates disperse, some furious, some terrified, some hollowed out, while the signal inside 3 I Atlas continued pulsing, steady, patient, almost as if waiting for our decision. What none of them knew was that right after the summit, the signal changed. Not in strength, not in frequency, but in structure. It became responsive. The moment the president authorized Operation Aegis, everything shifted from debate to execution. The tone inside NASA hardened. The screens changed. The language changed. Deadlines replaced hypotheses. And despite decades of advocating for science, exploration, and curiosity, I found myself in a room where the only acceptable outcome was annihilation. The order was simple. Total destruction of Comet 3 I Atlas. 
a nuclear interdiction in deep space. Teams from the Strategic Command arrived within hours. Engineers rolled out classified designs, modified high-yield warheads capable of surviving deep space radiation and delivering a precision detonation near the comet's core. Vandenberg Space Force Base prepared the launch protocols. I watched technicians, engineers, and physicists move with a mechanical urgency as if emotion had been switched off to make room for survival. But emotion had not disappeared from everyone. Protests erupted from the scientific community almost instantly. Colleagues I had worked with for decades confronted me in hallways, demanding explanations, accusing NASA of committing a crime against knowledge. Some shouted that humanity was destroying the only interstellar artifact capable of rewriting our understanding of the universe. Others whispered their fears that the signal inside 3i Atlas meant the comet was not a comet at all. I couldn't give them comfort because the truth was the signal had changed again. Every time we transmitted a diagnostic ping, the signal shifted subtly, rhythmically, like an echo adjusting to a new environment not intelligent in the way we understand intelligence, but aware, as if something inside the comet recognized we were studying it. That was the part I could not say publicly. Launch day approached, and inside mission control, the tension was suffocating. Operators rehearsed manual override procedures. Deep space tracking arrays aligned toward the target. The warheads on board AI performed stress simulations at a frantic pace. Even the room's lighting felt heavier, dimmer, as though the comet's presence thousands of miles away cast a shadow into our chamber. When the president asked for a final confirmation, NASA responded with a single word, proceed. And as the missile rolled toward the launch pad, the signal inside 3i Atlas emitted a new pattern, one we had never seen before, faster, sharper, like a warning or a countdown. It was the first moment I wondered if Operation Aegis was not simply a defense mission, but the beginning of something we had misunderstood entirely. The missile left Earth without ceremony, without countdown broadcasts, without the drama the public imagines when they think of space missions. It rose through the atmosphere like a silent spear, vanishing into the dark. And from that moment on, every heartbeat inside mission control synced to its trajectory as it accelerated toward the interception point, an orbital corridor between Earth and Mars, so narrow it felt like threading a cosmic needle. I monitored the signal from 3i Atlas the entire time. With every kilometer the missile closed, the signal sharpened. What began as a faint pulse now carried structure, modulation, almost a cadence. It wasn't communication in any language we knew, but it reacted to us. If we shifted the missile's telemetry beam, the signal shifted back. If we adjusted frequency, it answered in kind. Cause and effect. Observation and response. Like a mirror that had suddenly learned the difference between reflection and intention. Three days into the mission, a problem emerged. A cascading fault in the missile's guidance software. Anomalous interference high-frequency noise saturating the onboard sensors. Mission control scrambled to isolate the origin. Solar radiation? No. Particle collision? No. The interference pattern matched the signal coming from the comet itself. 3i Atlas was somehow disrupting our systems. We corrected the fault manually, but the error returned, stronger, as if the comet anticipated the fix. I watched code scroll across the screen, glitching in ways that felt purposeful. The missile was now fighting both physics and something else we could not name. When we reached the final approach window, the team prepared to arm the warhead. We had five minutes to initiate manual activation before the missile overshot the target. Five minutes to decide the fate of Earth and perhaps something more. The room was dead silent except for the click of keystrokes. Then the comet emitted a new burst, sharp, rising, harmonic, so intense our sensors overloaded. Screens flickered, telemetry froze, and for a moment every console in mission control went dark. When the systems rebooted, the missile was drifting off vector. Manual activation was the only option left. The countdown began. Operators shouted coordinates. The warhead awaited our command. 
And just as we prepared to trigger the sequence, the signal from 3i Atlas shifted into something unmistakably patterned, something that resembled structure, repetition, escalation. It wasn't a pulse anymore, it was a message or a warning, and we activated the detonation anyway. The flash appeared not as a distant spark, but as a blooming star, silent, white hot, expanding against the void like a flower made of pure radiation. For a brief moment, Mission Control forgot to breathe. Every screen flooded with sensor data, particle counts, fragmentation telemetry. And then slowly, impossibly, the silhouette of 3i Atlas dissolved into a storm of incandescent dust. The comet was gone, vaporized. Operation Aegis had succeeded, but success did not feel like victory. The moment the warhead detonated, the signal we had been tracking for months, steady, rhythmic, responsive, did not vanish. It expanded. Not in amplitude, not in strength, but in distribution. The frequency scattered through the debris plume, splitting into dozens of faint echoes like shards of a broken mirror. For several minutes, the dust cloud shimmered with electromagnetic pulses, each one reflecting a fragment of the original structure a final resonance, a dying breath, or something awakening. As the fragments dispersed, our sensors picked up an unexpected phenomenon, isotopic traces unlike anything in our databases, elements with decay signatures that violated known nuclear pathways, dust behaving like ionized plasma despite the absence of solar wind. We watched in silence as the remnants of 3i Atlas stretched into a thin spiral that drifted harmlessly toward the heliosphere. But harmlessness was not the question. The question was what we had destroyed. Hours later, telescopes from Hubble, Webb, and ground-based observatories confirmed total neutralization. No surviving core, no secondary fragments large enough to threaten Earth. Humanity was safe. The headlines would proclaim triumph. Leaders would speak of unity, decisive action, planetary defense. But inside NASA, the mood was muted, heavy, because the classification orders arrived before dawn. All spectrographic data, all decoded samples, all recordings of the signal, sealed. Operation Aegis was now a closed file. Even I received restrictions. The official narrative was simple. An unusually dense interstellar comet posed an impact threat, and Earth neutralized it. Nothing more, nothing unusual, nothing unexplained. But I had seen the raw data hours before the doors locked, and I knew what was being hidden. The isotopic anomalies, the electromagnetic interference, the responsive signal. And one final pattern, captured in the milliseconds after detonation. A pulse repeated three times, then silence. Not random not noise, a structure that did not match the comet's earlier emissions. Something changed in the instant of destruction, but the decision had already been made. Curiosity was no longer relevant, only survival. Weeks passed and yet the consequences lingered. The dust cloud began interacting with the solar wind in unpredictable ways, creating faint auroral structures across multiple planets. Jupiter glowed with new bands. Mars flickered with thin veils of light. Even Earth experienced brief, unexplained sky events, quiet swirls of luminescence at latitudes far from the poles. Beautiful, harmless, and deeply unsettling. Experts argued publicly about plasma dynamics, charged particles, heliospheric drift. But behind closed doors, a different question circulated. Did 3i Atlas send its final message before it died or because it died? I cannot answer that. Humanity chose safety over discovery, certainty over possibility, a controlled detonation over an uncontrolled encounter. Perhaps that was the only rational choice. Perhaps it saved us from a catastrophe we could never comprehend. Or perhaps in our fear, we silenced something that was never a threat at all. As a physicist, I've spent my life searching for meaning in the cosmos. But this, this was the first time I felt the universe look back. And the silence it left behind was louder than the explosion that created it.